to meet someone who is so committed to being a positive person and spreading positivity and spreading love, to me, is just super inspiring. Thank you guys for your continued support watching all of our Amplified Voices episodes. Make sure you subscribe to Amplify Africa's YouTube channel, like this video, comment, and let us know what you're thinking. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Amplified Voices, where we highlight Black voices around the world that are making an impact within their respective industries. My name is Debbie Alamru and I'm your host. Today, I am joined by a man who hails from the DMV and that stands for diversity champion, marketing mogul, and visionary. He started from the bottom and now he's the mind behind many multi-million dollar brands. An all-star Forbes 30 under 30 honoree who's been named as one of the most influential African-Americans. He's a champion of equality for minorities and women. He's the chief marketing officer at Artsy, the leading marketplace to discover, buy, and sell fine art. Everett Taylor, welcome to Amplified Voices. How are you? I'm good. I'm over here blushing. It's, it's weird hearing about myself. That was an incredible intro. Thank you. Oh, of course, of course. Now, Everett, you have received so many accolades from being recognized by Forbes as a member of the class of 2018, 30, 30 under 30, as well as the Forbes 30 under 30 all-star alumni in 2019. You've also received an honorary doctorate degree from Shaw University and just so much more. So what other award do you want on your mantle that is not already there? I mean, is it a Pulitzer, an Emmy, an Oscar, a Nobel? Nobel Peace Prize, what would you love to receive? You know what? I'll say this, Debbie. I've never, I've done countless interviews. I've never gotten that question once before. Really? That is, that is very interesting. Um, what award would I want on my mantle? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. Like, one. you know, the Amplify Africa one was pretty cool, you know, yes. to, 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 to feel like, you know, to have recognition that my impact was being felt um, across the diaspora is something that's, you know, extremely important to me, but there isn't anything that like sticks out to me. Anyone who knows me is, knows that I'm just not self-interested in that way where it's like, you probably even saw the video when I accept the award. I was probably mad yeah. awkward. It's just like, it's thank you, but I, I don't know. I don't know. I just, I just want to do some positive things, but. I love that though. It's almost like you don't actually even understand how big of an impact you are making. Um, and that that humble quality is always, it's always endearing and it, it is nice. But at the same time, Everett, you have to stop once in a while and just celebrate yourself because what you've done is huge. Um, so I'm curious, you became an entrepreneur at a really young age. So how did that, how did that journey begin for you? Yeah, I mean, it really was a, a journey of necessity more than anything. Um, and I, I tell people that like, you know, people tend to want to hear like some incredibly inspiring like thing. And I'm just like, uh, I just didn't want to end up on the streets. I wanted to be able to take care of my family. It was really, uh, it really came down to necessity. Like I, I dropped out of college to go help out my, my mom and my sister. And, you know, we were struggling and I was working at Joanne Fabrics, uh, making minimum wage. And literally when I would, the, the money that it would cost to drive there and to like eat lunch was like half of my pay for the day. I was like, this is ridiculous, you know? So I had to do something and that's what really inspired me to take um, my destiny a little bit into my own hands and really venture into the world of entrepreneurship because I felt that there had to be another way. It had to be another option out there for me instead of just working the normal day-to-day -day, nine to five or minimum wage job. Right. So I know that you grew up in Richmond, Virginia. Uh, what was yeah. your childhood like? And how did that shape the man that you are today? Well, first of all, I, it's funny that you said DMV because I don't think people consider Richmond part of the DMV, even though DMV okay. has Virginia in it. It's yeah. interesting. I've always seen DMV as uh, like the Northern Virginia because it's such a contrast between DC, Maryland, Virginia, Northern Virginia, and Richmond. It's 
very night and day, uh, the areas and in, in, in how I grew up. Um, but growing up in Richmond was, 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 was great in the sense that I got exposed to so much yet so little at the same time. Like I got exposed, I had to grow up fast and I saw a lot of things around me. Um, but I also was able to recognize that this was just a small piece of the world. Like there was so much more to see. So it helped me mature very, very fast, but also at the same time, it gave me the inspiration to want to seek out more. Ooh, I like that. So when you were younger, what did you aspire to do when you grew up? Oh, wow. I mean, I think I was basic as hell, like most kids. Like I wanted to be like a basketball player or an athlete or, um, you know, some, something like that. Like I, it wasn't like I had some grandiose, oh, I'm going to be a entrepreneur someday or a CMO someday or a CEO someday. It wasn't like that. I was just like a regular kid that thought he was going to be an astronaut or a basketball player or something like that. It was, that's a it, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't have, it's so funny. I hear some interviews and people are like, yeah, when I was a kid, I knew I was going to, I'm like, what kind of childhood did you have? Because I didn't even know that type of stuff was possible. I was like, either you rap or you play ball yep. or you sling drugs. Like those are the options. So I don't, I don't know how you knew that you had all of these incredible options there for you. So for me, it was just like probably like playing basketball. Okay. Now Forbes named you a marketing genius. And to me, a marketing genius is someone who makes other people's light bulbs light up. So how do you do that? Makes other people light bulbs light up. Did you come up with that? I did. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's dope. I might have to steal that. Um, you know, for me, I feel that the most important thing you can do as a leader, as a marketer, CMO, et cetera, et cetera, is make those around you better. I just spoke about basketball before. When I played basketball, I was a point guard. And traditionally, a point guard is helping the team. He's literally the captain on the floor, right? And, you know, is facilitating the ball and putting people in a position to be successful. He's the coach. He or she is the coach on the floor. And that's kind of the way that I look at my leadership style. Mm -hmm. I don't think I myself personally need to be the genius. It's the, ge the collective genius of my team. So if I can put people in a position to be successful and help them really tap into their abilities and their talents and really optimize their efforts, then collectively as a whole, we're only going to be better. I'm only one person. Right. You know, so for me, I feel like when you have the limit, I don't care how brilliant you are, you're still limited in scope if you're just one person. And it's really about the collective nature of of things when it comes to creating a successful business or a successful brand. And so really making sure that I nurture and I invest in the people that are around me. I love that. Now, how did you get your start in the tech industry and what did it teach you? How did I get my start? Well, you know, interestingly enough, my first company that I started, it was just like throwing parties and then we built um, some te tech infrastructure so that people could buy like tickets online and things like that. And so that was my first like foray into tech. And I didn't know what SaaS was like software as a service. So when I, when we were building this technology, I didn't think about, oh, this is something that's scalable that we can charge other people to use this technology like an event break. Right. And so I was such a novice when it came to technology, Silicon Valley, the entire tech world. We ended up selling that company and that company ended up getting flipped for like 10 or 11 X what we got paid for it. So in my mind, I was like, I need to figure out what's going on in Silicon Valley in this tech world, because obviously I, I got finessed and there's so much that I need to learn. And after I sold my company, I went back to college for a bit and um, I just I just needed to be a kid again for a little while. And I'm sitting in college and I realized that 
one, there's so much more I need to learn about the tech world. Two, why am I sitting here trying to get this degree? No offense to anyone who's listening to this, but like, I saw the path that a lot of people were going down. Like they go to college, they get their degree, they move to the DMV, they work for the government or they work for so-and-so, they make their money and they just slowly climb up, have a family, et cetera, et cetera. That was just very boring to me. The tech industry really was enticing to me. I wanted a different challenge. And so I said, F it. And I dropped out of college and I was, I moved to California within two weeks. Wow. And I started uh, as a head of marketing for an early stage startup, getting paid pennies. Yeah. But it was probably one of the best, you know, decisions I could have ever made because it kind of catapult, catapulted me into the career that I'm in today. I love that. So then how did that transition from the tech world into the art world happen for you? Wow, Debbie, all the hard questions. Um, That transition was interesting because it was slow. Like tech felt very like, like, oh, I'm just going to drop and da da da. Art was like a slow burn. Um, You know, I always loved art as a kid. I got discouraged by my art teacher when I was in seventh grade because he gave me a C in Uh, art class. How do you give a 12 year old a C? In art. Like, who does that? Right. I would say your name, but I'm not going to put you out there like that. Um, But thank you for the motivation. Um, But yeah, he gave me a C in art class because I was reading about, um, you know, the Keith Herrings of the world, the Basquiat street artists. And I didn't want to paint in this weird Bob Ross, like, paint the trees like this, you know? So I got to see in that class, I basically said, forget art for a while. And it wasn't until I moved to LA and I met uh, my ex-partner where she uh, actually had original art pieces in her home. Mm-hmm. And I never met somebody under 30 years old that had original works in their home. Which is mind blown. And she didn't have a lot, but it was still really cool. And we would go to like museums together and art shows together. And that became kind of my version of self care that I would take time away from work and just go to museums by myself in LA, like CAM and LACMA and MOCA and Underground Museum. And that was just my thing. And it wasn't until 2017, Mm -hmm. actually, May of 2000, it's been four years. And I was speaking at this event in Boston and there was this Afro-Latino artist named John Hen, Jonathan Enriquez. And he was au- not auctioning, he was raffling off of one of his pieces. Okay. And so I bought a couple of raffle tickets and I ended up winning it. And it was the first original piece of art that I had nice. ever like in my life. And I brought that to my home and I was like, whoa, my walls are really blank. Yeah. And then it just inspired me from like just an interior design perspective to try to add more art into my home. And then I quickly began to love the the art of collecting art and, and just art in general and meeting artists. And I saw a lot of the pain points that many artists endured within the industry, especially artists of color. And I became very passionate to be an advocate for these artists and help support them in their careers, which inspired me to start my own company, ArtX. And uh, ArtX had the mission of really helping democratize the the art space. And then I linked up with Artsy and realized that the missions for Artsy and ArtX were very, very similar. Artsy had more infrastructure, it's been around a decade, you know, it's a, you know, it's a big company, et cetera, et cetera. And the opportunity to come there and be CMO of that company at 30 years old was like to be at the number one online art company in the world. And it's still a tech company, but it's very much in the art space. It was like best of both worlds. So that's kind of how. It's like the perfect marrying of like your two worlds, which is really, really. Yeah, it's, 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 you know, it's so funny. People talk about 
dream jobs. And you hear this too now that uh, I feel like for millennials and younger, having a job is not cool anymore. <laughs> like it's all about entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. And I tell people all the time, you really have to find out what your purpose is. And if your purpose is through doing it through a job, especially one that pays well, <laughs> yeah. or uh, you're doing it yourself, either or, that's a win, you know? It's all about fulfilling your purpose and being happy in what you're doing. And to me, Artsy is literally the perfect mix of both my passions in tech and art. And I could not think of a better, I get recruited all the time, constantly. I can't think of a better place to be than RT. Well, that's one of my favorite sayings is find something you love to do and you never have to work a day in your life. So if you're For passionate sure. about something, so, okay, so you said tech and art are your passions, but you mentioned a trigger word that is one of my favorite things to talk about. So you're an advocate for diversity in Silicon Valley as well as in the art world, as you've said. So what are some of the, how would you define your purpose, Everett? Ooh, how would I define my purpose within tech, within art, or just in general? In general, yeah. I think my purpose is to lead with kindness in everything that I do. I like that. I think that the world needs more genuinely kind people and kind actions. So to live a life where everything I do is with positive intention, Mm. and it comes from a genuine place. I think that to me is my purpose to positively impact lives in that way. Whether it's something of just an inter interaction that I might have at my local bodega right. or my doorman to an artist, to colleagues, to you know, helping scale a company that helps out artists and small businesses and galleries the way that Artsy is. It's leading with this 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 intentional kindness in, in, in trying to do the right thing. I like that, that's beautiful. Now I've definitely been eyeing this piece behind you. So can you tell me the story of the piece or how you came to buy it? What's the background? Oh yeah, this, this is a artist named uh, Ferrari Shepard. Um, he is based and he's from Chicago. Um, he's from Cabrini Projects. I don't know if you're familiar with Cabrini Projects. You ever seen the movie Candyman? Yes. Yeah, those projects. Those okay, okay, projects. okay, okay. It's one of them down in Chicago. Like, originally from Chicago, spent some time in New York, been all over, was a music producer, uh, worked with Most Def, uh, where Yasin Bey is, he goes by now. And, um, yeah, really, you know, kind of lean into the art thing. And, you know, he's doing uh, really, really cool work. And, yeah, you know, I, I met him in New Orleans. And uh, before he was really known, and I bought a work then. Um, and then, you know, did my best to support and uh, spread the word of this artist. And then shortly before I left L.A., I acquired this piece as well. Beautiful. I love it. Now, Everett, they say that your dreams are not big enough unless someone laughs at it. So what is your dream that non-believers may laugh at today? Um, so I have this, this dream to start this company called uh, 2044 okay. to, end, uh, to end homelessness in the U.S. by the year 2044. Oh, wow. So that's like a project that um, I'm in the circle that. around. So people might laugh at that, like, oh, that's impossible, but yeah. it's not impossible. So that's that's something that I would I would really love to tackle. That's beautiful. And that ties into your purpose so perfectly. I love that. I love that's all I'm about now these days.
Thank you guys so much for staying tuned to Amplified Voices all season. What an incredible season it has been. I have had the great privilege of interviewing some incredible people from Ethiopia Haptamari, I'm chairman and CEO of Motown Records, to TJ Adeshola, head of sports at Twitter, uh, EVA Ani, an incredible journalist, and Claude Kamini, phenomenal designer who has made clothes for some of your favorite celebrities. All of the interviews have been great. If you haven't watched, make sure to go and recap because next season we're coming in stronger. Make sure you subscribe, like, share these videos and comment below and let us know who you wanna see on Amplified Voices next season. Thank you, bye.